You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music means we're coming at you a little bit earlier than usual today, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern here, about a half an hour before our normally scheduled time here for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, a program where the name pretty much says that all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is on the futures options side of the fence. You never know what we're going to talk about every week. That's why you have to tune in. Maybe some energy, maybe some rates, maybe some metals, maybe some ags, maybe some dairy, maybe some crypto. You never know what the heck is going to make it on TWIFO every week. That's why you have to tune in. That's why you should also follow us on the social medias and, of course, CME, because they're always going to share right before showtime the Movers and Shakers report. So you can see it for yourself exactly what is lighting things up over there at CME Group over the course of the past week, all the products that are tearing it up to the light side and to the dark side. So you can see, get a nice rough estimate of probably what's going to make it on the show every week. And of course, however you listen live after the fact, keep hitting us up, questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom. We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals out there. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. I am pleased to be joined holding down the FTSE Russell and CME Group hot seats. Once again, our old friend, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth management uncle mike welcome back to twifo sir it has been too long always happy to be here one of my favorite shows on the option uh on the options insider radio network but then they're all my favorites i was gonna well, say the option block i'm a little partial so. outside of the one you're on twice a week this is your favorite of course yes <laughs> all right mr uncle mike it's time to get dangerous it is time for the movers and shakers report it's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. 
All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers. Just a reminder, of course, you can generate just about all the reports we're going to talk about today for all the products at cmegroup.com slash twifo or slash twio, T-W-I-O. Both of those should work. Both of those would get you access to those free editions of the Bantic software, which is really great stuff. If you want to go above and beyond and you're really interested in these markets, I do encourage you to check out bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com. That'll get you into the demo versions for the premium version of the Quick Strike platform. We had Nick from Quick Strike in our Q&A not too long ago answering a lot of your questions. It really is a very robust. It's kind of the only game in town when you're talking about analytics on the futures options side of the fence. So if you want to see things like skew and vol and unusual activity and all these other things, correlation, you name it, including that movers and shakers report. That is a premium report. We just put it out there for you folks because we kind of like you. But all that stuff and a whole bunch more, bantix.com is the place to go, B-A-N-T-I-X.com, to begin your journey to the dark side. And speaking of the dark side, Mr. Uncle Mike, you know what I'm going to ask you now. Where should we begin our own journey on the show this week? To the light side or to the dark side, sir? I'm feeling kind of dark today. Let's do it. Ooh, that's because I, I told you about Jake the Snake earlier. It's make you think about dark side. That's what it is. I know where you're going there, Uncle Mike. All right, here we go. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listeners, check out the option block from earlier today. That's a callback. All right, let's go out to the dark side we go. By the way, listen, this week's report, it may surprise you given today's activity, which is mostly red on the screen. But outside of that, this week's report is actually mostly green. In fact, I would say it's roughly three quarters to the green side of the ledger, only about a quarter or so in the red. And most of them, not much there except for a couple there to the dark side. We'll get to those in a second, listeners. But to the dark side we go, number five. Hanging out in the metals first, one of Uncle Mike's favorite stomping grounds. Maybe we'll be heading back there today. We shall find out. It is platinum off 2.11%. You can see how kind of light the dark side is this week. Only cost you 2.1% to break into the top five to the dark side. So that's not much. Number four, good old KC Wheat. Listeners off 3.3%. Number three, SRW, a.k.a. Chicago Wheat, off 3.7%. Then we gap up a little bit. Now we're talking some business here. Number two, Palladium. I think the technical term is taking a drubbing off 18.41%. It was in the number four spot to the dark side last week off another 5.5%. So a rough couple of weeks out there for Palladium. Unfortunately, not a huge option story. So I'm not sure we can much to sink our teeth into out there, but an intriguing one nonetheless. And number one with an aggressive bullet. Again, kind of interesting given the headlines, everything else that's been going on out there. It's Nat Gas, listeners. Nat Gas coming in 21 0.23%. It was number one in the other direction last week, up 15.94%. You know, we talked about this with Dan Grams on the show a couple of weeks ago. We were kind of a little bit flummoxed as to why Nat Gas was selling off as hard as it did. Of course, we had the rally in the interim. So hopefully some of you got in some Nat Gas and maybe got the heck out of Dodge uh, because now we're getting look out below to the downside again. Uh, Also intriguing given the fact that we have this, you know, cold snap really blowing through the U.S. Nat Gas, usually a locally driven product. These days, of course, much more of a global product as well, but still intriguing to see uh, Nat Gas. I need to dig into that a little bit more. Maybe we'll come back to that. Let's go to the let's go to the light side now, listeners. It's such a robust week to the green that uh, the Russell 2000 is up four and a half percent, and it's only number nine. <laughs> so let's jump up a little bit. The actual top five listeners, uh, the NASDAQ. to the upside. It was number five in the other direction last week, off nearly 4%, 3.83%. So interesting couple of weeks for NASDAQ. Don't need me to tell you that. It's been topsy-turvy time out there in NASDAQ land. Number four, soybeans up a robust 7.42%. Soybean meal said, hold my bear, kid. It's up 9.59% for number three. Oats said, I laugh at you all. I'm up 11.68% this week. And then number one, with, unfortunately, no real options bullet, it's iron ore, up 12.3% up there this week. So intriguing stuff to start with. But you know what, Mr. Uncle Mike? It's one of your first times joining us here in the new year. And, of course, post-Fed action. So I kind of want to pick your brain on that before we get into some of these movers and shakers. We also have had, of course, you listeners are the ones who drive the show, especially you secret club fans. So if you're listening live, if you have a product category that you'd like to see us discuss on the show, put it there in the live chat. We have a few votes here for rates as well. So I think, Mr. Uncle Mike, I think we're going to hang our hat out there in the rates first. The Fed, the yield curve, 
Inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. All right, to the world of rates we go. Listeners, you know where to go. See me, group.com slash twifo or twio. Then get on into that drop down. Go on into interest rates in the asset class category. It's all the way down near the bottom, second from the bottom. Get into their interest rates. Select the U.S. rates from their listeners. And then I think because he likes to get on the boat with the 10-year note, we're going to hang out there first. So get on into the 10-year. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, a lot to unpack first. Your thoughts on everything going on in the world of rates post Mr. Powell. And then I know you like to watch yourself a little bit of the old 10 year. What's been catching your eye out there, sir? So a couple of things that are happening right now. Uh, The big talk right now in the financial media, aside from uh, the Ukraine and uh, Facebook slash Meta having awful earnings yesterday, uh, the big talk is, is with rates. And it seems like it's very likely that the Fed is going to raise interest rates in March. Whether or not that's going to happen, that's a topic for another day, but I, I, I think he will, uh, but we'll see. And so how does this affect us and what's the concern? What's the fear? What, what are a lot of people thinking on this? Well, first off, why on earth do we need to raise rates in the first place? Well, I, the reason that they want to, it's because of inflation. And how does inflation actually affect you? Well, I would say that 2021 was the biggest inflationary year that I have seen in my adult life. Now, I think in the early 80s, we had some higher inflation. But like I said, my adult life, or at least the the life where I'm older, maybe not necessarily more mature. You can ask my wife on that one. But I think that with inflation going up so much this last year, that the Fed almost has to do something just to answer it. Now, I have a theory and and my theory is that we may have seen the end of inflation. Have we or not? But who knows? But we may have. Why is that? We've had such a non-inflationary period over the course of the last 20 years by comparison to history in general that it feels like it all just kind of came last year. Meaning that any anytime you go out to eat or go to a store Uh, Anyone who hasn't been living under a rock has seen that prices have increased very significantly over the course of the last year. Now, no politician wants to be in office when interest rates are going higher, because that typically means that a lot of times asset prices will go lower. If you're going to have a higher interest rate to get the mortgage for a house you're going to buy, then you can't afford as much house. And so ultimately, that will drive the price of real estate lower. Similar concept with stocks, with buying cars, et cetera, et cetera. But why do we want to drive down those prices? Well, if consumers aren't making enough money to pay the higher prices, that's a problem. And that ultimately can hurt the economy. So that's the reason that rates are even thought of to be raised in the first place is to kind of slow things down a little bit so that prices don't increase too rapidly. And that's why the Fed is considering doing it. Now, my theory of perhaps we have seen the end of inflation or not the end of it forever, but it's not going to continue at 5% a year after 2021. I can see it continuing, but not at that level. My theory considers that, but what I'm saying is that if the Fed does raise rates in March, inflation will let I think inflation could be more under control by March, April, if prices aren't going up significantly. And I'm not convinced that they really want to raise rates that much at this point in time. Because if we do have something bad, the the eighth wave of Omicron, COVID, mu, or whatever Greek letter you want to use, I think that they don't want to be in a position to where they're forced to just eliminate interest rates instantly like they did when COVID first hit in 2020. So I think I could see them pausing rate increases after March. And does that mean they're going to say, oh, we're never going to raise rates, Uh, you're fine, and then watch asset prices go up? No, I don't think that. But I do think that if they raise rates and they see that prices aren't going up significantly, I could see them doing what the Fed does quite frequently, and just all the football coach in me will say this, 
the Fed will just come out and say, give me the punt team, because they're just going to punt to the next quarter. They'll just say, well, we'll have an accommodative policy. We might raise rates if we need to. We might not raise rates. And then they'll say whatever it is they say. And um, financial journalists will argue. But after, if we do have a rate raise in March, it would not surprise me if we paused for a few months after that, even though I believe last time I looked, the Fed futures were calling for, I believe, between two and three rate hikes for 2022. So that's kind of what I'm seeing right now in the world of rates. But uh, we will see where it goes. We shall see indeed. Listeners, like I mentioned, go into that report, go to that drop down, pull over to the 10 year. That's where we're going to park ourselves right now. If you're wondering how much paper in the 10 year right now, yeah, it's a pretty robust product, to put it mildly. 1.88 million contracts <laughs> on the tape right now. So nothing to sneeze at out there. By the way, the 10 year at 127. Almost 127.2 out there, off slightly on the week, about 0.11 or off about a quarter of a percent. And in terms of the action, it's in the March contract that has about 15 days to go. That did over half of that nearly 1.9 million contracts, about 56% of the paper going up in that March contract. So very, very concentrated paper this week. And if you're wondering vol-wise, <laughs> we've always said to get a little bit farther along the yield curve, not exactly a bastion of volatility. And that is pretty much the case. The March contract trading at a whopping 498, 4.98 plus is not even a five. It's off about 0.3 this week. So that's coming in quite a bit, given that you're starting a little bit north of five, coming in a third of a point. That ball is coming in uh, quite a bit in terms of skew. Again, not a huge skew player either. Last week, the puts 3.1% bid. So you're going to pay 3.1% premium on top of that roughly 5% at the money ball to get those 25 delta puts if you were so inclined. This week, they've come in a little bit. They're only 2.1% bid. So you got to pay up to, oh my goodness, 6.1% <laughs> to get those uh, get those puts out there. So there you go. Not, not a lot of extra juice in the puts. The calls last week, 2.2% cheap. This week, 26 So we're seeing a very slight equity style skew. <laughs> The key word there is slight. It's only 3% to the dark side and about 2.6% on the upside there. But uh, <laughs> slight. But outside of that, uh, slight equity skew forming there in the 10-year. In terms of action, what was the most active contract? I said we're at a little bit north of 127 listeners. It was the 127 even puts leading the dance out here this week, doing a whopping 173 thousand contracts that's more than some of the other complexes we want to talk about listeners that's quite a bit uh, most of the action coming up on tuesday seventy thousand going up on tuesday about twenty one thousand of that closing today fifty three thousand on the tape so no slouch today either we don't know obviously today's oi change monday thirty one thousand slightly closing and wednesday about twenty thousand also slightly closing so it seems like mostly biased towards closing on the 127 put strike this week followed hot on its heels by the 126 even puts doing 125,000. Again, these numbers are just gigantic out here in the rates listeners. 125,000 of these bad boys. Again, the busiest day almost Tuesday was number two, actually. The busiest day actually today out there on the 126 puts about 47,000 of those hitting the tape today, followed by about 44,000 on Tuesday. Only about a couple of thousand of those opening. So kind of a lot of back and forth on the 126 puts. On Tuesday, which is interesting, 23,000 on Monday, 11,000 on Wednesday, and then right behind it, 126 half. So kind of a nice little put strip there, <laughs> dominating the tape out there in the 10-year note this week. 121,000 contracts on the tape there. The big day, Tuesday again, 49,000 going up on Tuesday, slightly opening. 39, almost 40,000 so far today, and then about 20,000 on Wednesday, 14,000 on Monday, back and forth, opening to closing throughout most of the week. So it was pretty much all puts all the time this week, listeners. And in those three puts, <laughs> we have, oh, about 430,000 contracts just in those three, those three puts. So that's, that's no small amount of paper listeners out there. So I hope you enjoyed your stop along the rates. We could spend the whole show on each one of these complex listeners, but we have to keep on rolling. It is time now, listeners. We did see Palladium at number two. To the dark side this week, off 18.41%. We saw platinum at number five, off 2.1%. Iron ore leading the light side <laughs> at 12.3%. And, of course, Uncle Mike likes himself a little bit of the metal, so perhaps we'll head out there next. 
lives beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, we've got some votes in our chat for the metals there as well. You like Uncle Mike and the metals? I hear you. I hear you. Uncle Mike likes to talk a few products, and metals are clearly one of them. You know where to go, listeners, to find this report for yourselves. Go into that asset class drop down. Back out of the rates, go down to the bottom of the list and go to metals. And then, Uncle Mike, I will allow you to choose where we begin the metals. I know you like yourself some silver or you're feeling more precious, you're feeling gold. What is lighting up your tape in the world of metals this week, sir? Let's go with gold. I always go with silver. Let's mix it up a little bit. All right, let's do it. What is lighting up your tape in the world of the shiny stuff, sir? I just want to see something different. I know every time I'm on this show, I end up talking about silver, but uh, let's talk about gold. I know in the past you put on some long-term collars in silver. Uh, Have you done similar stuff out there in gold? We haven't really discussed your gold trading to a great extent, sir. Well, I mean, for the most part, I I like gold for the long term. It's funny, a lot of the gold bugs out there, uh, it's it's like a civil war in in the gold bug world because some of them have defected to the crypto world. Uh, But um, I I think gold's a good long-term holding in in a person's portfolio. Uh, silver is going to be more of like a poor man's gold, but definitely like gold as well. Um, in terms of the skew that exists on it, I, a lot of times you do have the reverse skew. Uh, usually silver, it's a little bit more pronounced. So that's why I tend to prefer silver, but um, definitely like some gold too. I know that over the course of the last year or so, uh, it has been relatively flat, but it seems to me that where gold is right now, um, it could actually be in a spot to where it could start to break out. It's like in mid 2019. Um, I'm sorry, mid 20. Sorry, uh, stumbling on my words here, and I'm not even drinking. Um, in mid 2019, uh, it kind of peaked out in July or in late July, early August, and that's been kind of flat ever since. Uh, it's kind of been in that a little bit of a range, and so I'm curious to see that with this talk of rate increases. Could this actually be something for gold to break out? Now, if gold does break out, um, I believe it would be, well, it could be for a variety of reasons. But if we have an increase in rates, uh, could that be to where money is getting out of bonds and maybe into gold? Uh, That's a definite possibility. Uh, A lot of times people believe that gold is an inflation hedge. And there's no doubt in my mind that we've had a lot of inflation in 2021 but gold was relatively flat. And so now perhaps it could be time to buy gold as a little bit of a late reaction to inflation that came in 2021. You could get the gold moved to the upside in 2022. Let's see what's moving out there right now. By the way, I just looked for those of you out there who are hoping, maybe holding out hope for a little bit of platinum or palladium. Platinum so far this week has a whopping 53 contracts on the tape. And palladium, a whopping two. So unfortunately, we won't be hanging out out in either of those, even though they are big movers. Platinum, I should say palladium, getting just annihilated this week. But unfortunately, nowhere really to sink our teeth from an options perspective. So to gold we go. Again, it's kind of uh, the reigning king of the metals, even though this week a pretty decent, pretty robust week, 127,000 contracts on the tape. Remember what I just said, some of those puts in the 10-year do more than the entire metals complex, or at least the entire gold complex, and that's what we have right here. Those 127 even puts did what I say, 170-odd thousand contracts. That's about almost 50,000 more than the entire gold complex here. But say up. I digress. Let's get on into the land of the metals this week. By the way, gold holding firm a little bit north of 1,800 right now, 1,807 pretty much to be precise. That's up about uh, 20 handles, a little over one, about 1.2% on the week. Remember, our This Week in reports start from pretty much Monday session and go till now. When we're talking about the movers and shakers, we extend the dial all the way back to the end of our show last week. That's why the numbers are going to be a little bit different when we're crunching them here. But when you're looking at the reports on the CME website, it's going to have from the beginning of that week. So a decent week for gold here. That almost that wouldn't have been enough to break into the into the top five, need to be five and a half percent, but it would have been at least relevant to the conversation out there this week. And in terms of where the action was, it's again, the March contract has about 20 days to go doing about 40% of the paper out there this week. So we're going to hang our hat out there. We're wondering what is gold vol out there right now? And the gold vol has been very interesting for a lot of people right now, because as 
very much a corollary to what we're seeing in the crypto space, as Uncle Mike alluded to. A lot of people have moved from the gold land into crypto land and maybe kind of straddling both sides of the fence. I mean, the, the gold bugs used to be pretty much the most hardcore folks we had on the network. Whenever we said anything that was even remotely questioning of gold's potential to the upside, we heard from those people. That has definitely changed now. Gold bugs are like a distant fifth out there. They're behind the crypto heads. They're behind the hardcore meme stock kids and everything else out there who if you dare question any of their holdings. They'll, you'll hear from them. <laughs> but gold bugs, yeah, they've fallen by the wayside a little bit out there these days. And in terms of the vol, kind of the same story. Gold vol coming in quite a bit this week. This is a lot for gold vol to come in. Gold vol right now at about a 12 and three quarters off about one and three quarters points this week. So that's that's a lot for a gold ball, which doesn't move a ton usually to come in that much. That's saying something right now. Again, your gold ball can spike. And when it does, those moves are kind of usually a little bit short lived. So we could see the tail end of one of those spikes right now coming off, but still intriguing stuff. That's why I use the analogy to crypto because I've said many times that Bitcoin and ETH ball, the two leading crypto assets, kind of perform like precious metals from a ball perspective right now. They're obviously much higher overall levels, but in terms of how they can tend to spike but then they tend to come back down to that range and they'll hang out in that range and maybe gently drift lower for a while. Then they'll have a little bit of a spike, then kind of come back down and gently drift lower again. That's typically what we see in gold and what we're seeing again right now. In fact, not really gently drifting at all. We are plummeting nearly two points this week. In terms of skew, Uncle Matt was talking about the skew. It's usually pretty call heavy out here in gold land. This week, it's all about the puts. It was 4.1% bid to the puts last week, 5% even bid to the puts this week. The calls, nobody wants to touch them. They were about half a percent cheap last week. They were about three quarters of a percent cheap this week. So I guess from that perspective, if you're looking at getting yourself some upside, it might be a bit of a bargain to the upside in gold calls right now because usually there's a bit of a pronounced bid to those. This week, not so much. It's all about the downside, listeners. And in terms of the most active contract, I said we're at about 1807 or so when we kicked off this segment. The most active contract this week, listen, it looks like it was pretty far out of the money. It was the 1,700 puts going up here in this March contract. About 9,000 times, listeners. The big day was today, about 3,500, 3,000, actually 3,100 on Tuesday, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Opening throughout most of the early part of the week. Obviously, we don't know today's action, but still, that's a pretty far out of the money put to be opening with the <laughs> about 20 days to go can we make 100 handles in 20 days listeners again it's not unheard of but it would be a pretty aggressive move out here in all things all things gold of course it could be selling these too either way but intriguing stuff nonetheless given the fact that the put wing got a nice little bid this week i'm gonna go out on a limb and say they were probably biased towards opening buying those which is a kind of an interesting play right behind it we have listeners looks like a bit of a, a kind of a tie between the 17 half puts, which are a little bit more reasonable, doing about 4,500. The big day actually today. The 18 half calls in March doing about 4,000 contracts. Again, the big day today with about 1,100. And then the 21 half calls in June going up about 4,000 times this week as well. The, pretty much all of that yesterday, 2,800 yesterday and 1,000 today on the 21 halves. That's an interesting one in June. Looks like that might be part of a bit of a ratio. It's always hard to tell the ratios to the upside because it's not quite two to one, but it's pretty close because 1,500 of the 2,000 calls also went up yesterday. So one by two, 2,021 halves. I don't see any other legs against this. So it's a bit of a weird one if that is the case, but we do see a lot of strange ratios. And then both of them traded 1,000 contracts again today, 2,000 and 21 half. So Strange they would do the same number now if they wanted to do the ratio yesterday. But either way, weird stuff afoot to the upside in June. We always like to look a little bit farther out in gold. Listeners, that is usually where the weird stuff is found to the upside. Looks like some paper going up here in D's of this year. The 2,000 calls trading about 3,300 times this week and also about 1,300 of the 2,200. Pretty much all of that today, actually. The 2,200 is pretty much trading all of that today. And the 2000s trading most of that today. So it looks like pretty much one by two again. There's 2200s going up about almost 1400 times. 2000s going up 2800 times pretty much. So pretty much one by two there. Then we have the 2400s going up 600 times today. 26 quarters, 482 times. 
And then the 18, it's like a crazy strip again. We've talked about these before, these, these kind of funky ladders that go up in a lot of the futures options. Seems like someone perhaps doing that as well. But the ratios are what's kind of crazy here. So we have the 2,400, 2,200, 2,000 going up on all sorts of crazy ratios. Also 26 quarters, 1,800s and 2,300s going up for a smaller size on the ladder. But that's just weird stuff. Mr. Uncle Mike, have you ever noticed the funky one by twos and flies that tend to go up all the time in the upside on the precious stuff, in particular gold? And have you ever been inclined to try your hand at any of these, sir? Definitely noticed it. And quite honestly, that was one of the reasons I wanted to pick gold, because it seems like gold, even more so than silver, just has these crazy things in it that there's people out there that are just trying to take a shot by buying something out of the money that they think it's either going to that's going to be a big move in one way, shape or form. So definitely noticed it. Um, I think the only t- I, I, I definitely a tried my hand a couple times but my hand got burned so i stopped trying it after a couple times quite honestly uh but you do see a lot of this stuff and it it just makes you wonder who is doing this and what they're looking for but it happens all the time it's not like it's just some weird thing like every now and then we'll talk about how like there's a bunch of paper going up for the 100 calls on the vix or something like that you hear about that maybe I I don't know, maybe once every year or two or something crazy like that. But it seems like with the precious metals, something like that, it's always happening, it seems. Yeah, if you had to ask me any given day, hey, name a product that's probably doing a ratio or a fly sometime today or this week, I would always just point to gold and say, yeah, there's there's a fly out there somewhere. There's a funky, crazy out-of-the-money call ratio going up out there. Any week, you're right. There's a couple of trades that are like clockwork these days. The metals upside, in particular gold, metals ratios, and the far out of the money put harvesting going up in spy every week to the tune of hundreds of thousands of contracts, it seems like, some weeks. So those are kind of the two old faithful, old reliables you can kind of count on every week if we were so inclined. We could feature them on the show every week. Uncle Mike, I will give you a choice next. Do you want to hit quickly on silver or do you want to dive into your other beloved side of the fence, which is equity, sir? You know what? We might as well go for some silver. It wouldn't be an Uncle Mike show or wouldn't be an Uncle Mike guest appearance on Twifo without silver. Let's just do it. All right. Silver it is. Go to that same drop down. Listeners, back out back out of gold, I should say. Pop into silver. Silver at about a 2240 coming into the start of the segment, up about half a percent on the week. It's not a huge week out there in silver. Of course, silver has kind of been this on again, off again commodity over the course of the last year. We talked Quite a while ago now. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but of course, all the love about the silver short squeeze that never materialized. But there has been a little bit more trading interest in silver, it seems like, over the course of the past year. Coming into today's show, not even 20,000 contracts on the tape, about 19,000. So you're talking about silver again. It's one of the more active metals, but still very light compared to gold. And certainly, when you're talking about the 10 year, nearly 2 million contracts on the tape, silver much lighter. And of that, I said we're at about a 2240. Let's see, the most active contract with about 40% of that going up. Once again, in the March contract, has about 20 days to go. If you're wondering, what is silver vol right now? It's at about a 26. So a wee bit frothier than gold. It's still off this week as well, off about two, almost two and a half handles, about 2.4 points this week. So still holding out at about a 26. So a little bit more juice for the harvesting, if you are so inclined out there in silver. Uh, Skew-wise, the puts last week, 2.1% bid this week. Catching a bid, 5.1% bid, so popping about three points on the puts. Calls, same deal. Nobody wants calls in either silver or gold. Last week, they were three-quarters of a percent rich. This week, they're half a percent cheap, so they've swung fully in the other direction and are at a discount right now. That's interesting. And in terms of the most active, we're at about a 2240 right now in silver. It was the 21-quarter puts in March doing about a 1,000 contracts. That was the lion's share of the activity. Mr. Uncle Mike, does it surprise you at all when I'm talking about these SKU numbers that both in gold and silver, two products that are usually known for a bit of some call SKU that nobody wants them at all in both these products this week, sir? Yeah, it is kind of intriguing. That's for sure. So I, I think that crazy times to where if... um we can have talk of interest rates rising and we can have high inflation after 20 years of seemingly no inflation. 
I can't say that I'm surprised. And really quickly before we get out of silver, what have you been up to out there? I know you had your two-year collar. You've kind of done some adjustments to it. Catch us up. What is your, your latest out there in the world of silver, sir? So what I'm doing right now is – uh, my, what I did last year, and I'm using this as kind of a, in the safer section of the portfolio for clients. Uh, last year, what I did was I went one year out. I did a, a, a sold a put spread one year out. And with the credit I received from the put spread, I bought a call spread a little bit further out of the money. Uh, and it was an even money trade. And then I adjusted it a little bit as the year went on to where I ended up losing like 2% or something like that on silver for the year. Uh, even though silver was down uh, 13 to 15%, just depending on what way you're looking at it. And so this year, what I ended up doing was I still have a put spread, but I was actually able to buy a long call option without having to go with a call spread. And so it was definitely a shift that I felt and so what I'm doing is, is that let's say silver does go down to $10. Uh, if that's the case, then we're hedged above that with a put spread. And I have enough money set aside to where we'll be able to just own silver at $10. If that's the case, I'm more than happy to do that because then I think it would definitely be a buying opportunity. But then if silver does go higher, the long call will uh, account for any increase in silver uh, once it's above that long call strike price level. And so eventually, if silver is to have the big year that I've been telling people it's going to have the last 10 years, and I've obviously been wrong about, uh, then my thought is, is that if it does go into the 30s or the 40s, like a thief in the night, like silver does at times, then I would just simply close the put spread and essentially have a a call that was paid for with the put spread and then just live on that for the rest of the year and see where it takes me. So that's what I'm doing right now in the silver world. So the skew has definitely modified a few things in my world to say the least. And uh, I definitely like this position better because I have a long call and it's closer to uh, where I'm at. And where we are at listeners is that it is time to keep on rolling right on into the equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the world of equities. Go to that drop down, pop out of the metals, and head on over into the equities. We'll start in the old S&P 500. You guys like the old E-mini out there. Before we get into that, let's set the table from a vol perspective. Obviously, you can't really talk equities without talking the flip side of that coin, which is volatility, RVX, so the VIX of small caps, uh, back over a 30 listeners, even though it's, it was a little bit higher, shall we say, last week. Still looking robust, still over that 30 handle at about a 32 when we kicked off the show. That's down about exactly five points from this time last week. So small cap vol, still frothy, perhaps not quite as frothy as last week when we were in the pretty much the teeth of a correction out here but we'll see every week is crazy out there in small caps land uh vix today when we kicked off the show at about a 24 exactly that puts it down a whopping eight and a half handles <laughs> from where we were this time last week so remember this time last week listeners we were kind of in the teeth of of shall we say some vol some froth out there over a 30 handle in the vix still frothy still at a 24 that's nothing to sneeze at but down from that 32 and a half level of last week a VVIX, so the vol of vol at about a 123 and a quarter, down about 21 and a half points from this time last week. So obviously, that coming in quite a bit as well. Vol Q, the at the money vol of the NASDAQ, that's at about a 28 even when we kicked off the show. That's still down about five and a third points, but that has been ticking up all day as we are seeing, of course, that sell off out there in the broad equities. That puts that VIX to RBX spread, so the small cap to large cap vol spread. We're at about eight points, about 7.9 points. That's still pretty wide. That's about three and a half points wider than it was even this time last week. So that's nothing to sneeze at out there. And if you're wondering, S&P to NASDAQ, so VIX to ball Q, that's at about four points. That has widened out as well. That's about a little over three, about 3.2 points wider than this time last week. So we've seen that sometimes on the show that NASDAQ to S&P vol spread has been non-existent. They've been at the exact same level this week, widening out again to about Four points. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, I know you like to watch yourself a little bit of the old S&P. What's catching your eye out there in the world of equities these days, sir? I think that with where we are right now, what's catching my eye first off is that we've dipped below the 4,500 mark uh, just right now. And 
4,500 is a key number. It's just, it's a, a hundred increment number, if you will. And we've gone below it during the time that we've been recording our shows today. So that's the first thing that I'm seeing. Uh, but then the other thing that I'm seeing is that we've rallied off so much over the course of the last five days in S&P land that I think we're bound to have a pullback at some stage. And why not today, so to speak? Uh, the fact that we've had uh, the uh, awful earnings announcement that we had in Meta, which we talked about on the option block earlier today, uh, we have actually rallied uh, the low of the S&P on the 24th of January, uh, around the 4,200 mark. And then all of a sudden we rally 7% over the course of eight days or whatever it's been. Then it's we're bound to have a, somewhat of a pullback at some stage. Now, what is concerning about this is that we may have gotten to close to a 50% retracement on the pullback that started from the all-time highs in on January 2nd, uh, the first day of, of cash trading for the year in the S&P. And when we get to that level, perhaps this is just the another leg down. We might have a little bit more to go. But I personally, uh, I know this is going to shock you, Mark. I have a little bit more of a bullish view on this just because of the fact that we had one of our biggest stocks in the S&P 500, one that a lot of people watch, and it's a behemoth, if you will, in the stock world, that is Facebook, down 26% on the day uh, because of bad earnings. And the fact that the S&P 500 itself is definitely down, but it's not down a lot more, I think that's kind of a bullish sign quite personally, but um, it's definitely a volatile sign because this is, anyone who says that this market is not volatile uh, is a crazy person, quite frankly. So I am bullish, <clears throat> and I think that there can be opportunities to sell puts uh, or do things like that in the S&P right now. I don't know if I would necessarily want to go and all out buy it, but there's definitely a lot of opportunities at this stage in the S&P 500 for sure. Opportunities we shall see. Get into that drop down, listeners. Of course, uh, some paper on the tape out there this week, as you might imagine. 2.9 million contracts already going up in the E-mini S&P 500. So a little bit of tape, a little bit of paper, I should say. S&P kicking off for this segment at about a 44.92 and three quarters. So like Uncle Mike said, shy of the 4,500 level right now. And you know, most of the paper this week going up, yeah, 28, almost 29% going away in one day. That's a lot of that nonsense puts I was talking about. 38 half puts went up 32,000 times this week. 39.75 puts went up almost 35,000 times this week. So you take a lot of that near-term premium harvesting nonsense out of this. Again, that's right around their level they usually like to be. They're right around somewhere between six and 800 points out of the money any given week. We can talk about those puts, but those are nonsense. Interesting stuff this week, though. If you go a little bit farther out, that's what makes it surprising. Usually, all we can talk about in the E-mini S&P is going out today or next week or we have to go all the way out to march which is a surprisingly long time it seems like an eternity for the e-mini s&p 500 to find our big second biggest dog this week actually listeners uh, the march contract this week 15 percent of the paper and let's see that has 42 almost 43 days to go that's a long time it's a relative eternity for for the s&p traders and a lot of paper to the upside. It was the 4550 calls, uh, not that far upside anymore, <laughs> doing about 28,000 that kind of caught our eye here, listeners. In fact, looks like a big strip went up on Monday. People just getting the heck out of Dodge on their March upside in the S&P. We saw about 20,000 of the 44 halves going up, pretty much all of that closing. 23,000 of the 45 halves going up, pretty much all of that closing as well. And twenty, almost 21,000 of the 46 halves, all going up on Monday, pretty much all of that closing. So that makes that kind of upside call strip in the S&P 500 kind of uh, right up there with number one. And certainly in terms of actually relevant paper outside of those stupid nonsense puts, this is kind of some of the biggest stuff. We also saw about 27,000 of the 4,200 puts going up this week in March. Uh, the big day was Tuesday, about 14,000 of those biased towards opening. So folks taking off their calls to the upside. And putting on, or at least opening, some uh, 4,200 puts here in the March S&P. That is kind of interesting. We don't see that kind of paper 
going up that often out here. Again, usually it's all dominated by forgettable paper that's going out tomorrow. So perhaps some folks giving up the ghost out there to the upside. I mean, 4450, those are still in the money and they're closing those out as well. So intriguing stuff out here in the land of March. Before we get on out of equities, listeners, we got to take a spin through small caps. A lot of you have been asking and talking about small caps. They are moving and shaking. We saw them pretty much leading everybody else into pretty much correction territory before having a bit of a rebound here, threatening the 2000 level again this week, 1990 out there on the tape right now. So up about one and a quarter percent for the week. Again, uh, 2000 level was a big one when we broke through it to the upside. Now we're back through it to the dark side. Will we hang out here for long? That's the main question. Uh, let's see. Decent paper, about 30,000 contracts on the tape here for rut over there at CME. Again, people are always asking, is it upside calls, small delta calls that's dominating the tape? And there's a lot of that, 20 halves going out tomorrow. (laughs) Pretty active here this week. So those certainly qualify as small delta now. Usually there's some puts trading it up out here as well. Uh, That is not the case this week, though. It seems like it's mostly calls uh, 2290s also going up in week week three February that have 15 days to go. And these have done about about 500 contracts as well. 2290s, that's an interesting strike. Those have been pretty much opening all week long. So some folks opening up at right around the 2300 level in the S&P as well, going out in a couple of weeks. Can we make those levels by in a couple of weeks? That'd be an impressive run for all things small caps. By the way, skew-wise and vol-wise, let's go out here to, again, that week three contract in Feb, that has 15 days to go. That one has about 14% of the paper this week. The vol out here in uh, that week three contract at about a 31 and a quarter. It puts it off about three and three quarters points from this time last week. Skew wise, the puts 16 and a half percent bid. I should, yeah, 16 and a half percent bid coming in this week, 14.4 percent bid. So the, the put skew not quite as crazy as it was uh, this time last week. The calls last week, 12.4 percent cheap. This week, the calls cheaper, 13.7 percent cheap. So puts coming in, calls coming in this week as well as vol has come in. In the small cap. So intriguing stuff out there. And really quickly, before I get to some of your questions, I want to do a quick pop into energy because that complex is lighting it up as well. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody, get out of that drop down for the equities. Head on over into energy. We're going to hang out in nat gas. Right now, listeners, so kind of weird stuff across the board. Nat gas coming in to the start of this week. We're seeing at about a 491 or so in that front contract that has about 20 days to go. That's up 6% on the week. Obviously, a little bit down from our show uh, this time last week, but intriguing stuff nonetheless. Here, let's look really quickly at what's lighting it up. Let's go to that front contract because 20 days is within our, our frame of reference there. Vol wise, what is vol in the nat gas right now? Well, it's coming in quite a bit. <laughs> it's at a 76 right now. It's off 20, almost 21 points from this time last week. So it certainly has a apocalyptic vol move out there. That's that's coming in aggressively. In terms of the skew, by the way, right about a 491 in that front contract right now for nat gas. The puts last week, 8.3% cheap. This week, nearly 14% cheap. So puts coming in. Calls last week, 13.2% bid. This week. Staying at about that level, at about 13.4%. So ticking up a little bit, but not a huge change. And in terms of where the action was this week, if you said six calls going out in about 20 days, then you are the winner, winner, chicken dinner. 25,000 of these things have gone up this week. Half of those, 12,250 going up yesterday, about 9,000 today. The rest scattered throughout the week. Slightly biased towards openings. It seems like the six strike, a lot of back and forth. On the six strike listeners, also the four puts doing pretty decent paper. Twenty three thousand out there as well. Uh, the big day Wednesday, seven thousand contracts going up on Wednesday, and about six thousand on Monday. Back and forth on both of those days, six thousand today as well. So the six calls, four puts trading hot and heavy all week long here, listeners. So intriguing stuff out here in Nat Gas. Kind of want to just pop in really quickly because it is in our movers and shakers report this week and. A lot of people are looking at Nat Gas, and a lot of people are asking which different products to use to trade it. But to straight up Nat Gas products, you can't beat those when you want to get Nat Gas exposure. And having an interesting topsy turvy couple of weeks. Let's look really quickly to see if we can see any weird prints before we get on to some of your feedback really quickly, listeners. 
Uh, three puts pretty active out here in June, about 6,000 of those going up this week. Five halves going up in April, 16,000 of those. So five halves pretty active out there in the next contract out. We have six calls trading 2,500 times all the way out in March of next year. So uh, intriguing stuff afoot here, listeners, in NatGas. Let's see what else is intriguing. Let's see what you folks have on the brain. It's time for a quick stop into your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome to your feedback segment. We've got a live question here from uh, Options Queen for you, Uncle Mike. She wants to know, what is Uncle Mike's preferred product for trading the 10-year? She wants to know, how should she get on the boat with the 10-year note, Mr. Uncle Mike? Well, I think there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, um, if I could make it so that everybody could be in the 10-year itself uh, and perhaps sell puts or sell covered calls on that, the futures and the futures options, that would be the best way to go. But in my world, sometimes that's not always the easiest thing to do. So oftentimes I'll use IEF, which is an ETF uh, that tracks the seven to 10 year note. Options are not the most liquid on it. So it is difficult to get in and get out of them. Whereas oftentimes I do go to settlement with those options just because of the fact that I'm fine getting called away or just letting it expire worthless. So I think you have two main choices if you're looking to do the 10-year, either the futures themselves and the futures options themselves, which would be my preferred method, or you could use IEF, which is an ETF. Speaking of choices for Uncle Mike, Mr. Uncle Mike, your poll finished up. Right as we were doing the show here. So I have the results. Maybe you and I have not even seen these yet for your own poll. You asked folks, should you do a webinar on row? And a whopping 75% of them said yes, Mr. Uncle Mike. So getting back to that rates love. So what say you? Are you going to do the hotly anticipated row webinar, sir? I, I need more followers. I'm not going to do it and not going to go through it unless I can get more followers. If I can get my followers up to... Up another hundred within the next few weeks, then I'll do it because I know some people want it, but I want to get followers because I want some people to, 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 to talk to Row about if I'm going to do it. All right, Uncle Mike's being greedy, listeners. So get on over there at Mike Tusaw, T O S A W, all one word on the old Twitters. Give him some followers so he'll do that much anticipated, hotly anticipated, dare I say it, beloved. Row webinar people have been talking about for so many years. Uncle Mike, unfortunately, that music means, man, we crammed a lot of living into an hour, and there's still products we didn't get to. <laughs> but before we go, I mentioned your Twitter. If folks want to check you out, want to reach out to you, where should they go? What should they do, Mr. Uncle Mike? A couple ways. You can definitely follow me on Twitter, at Mike Tusaw. Uh, you can also, I'm putting out YouTube videos. Just uh, type in the box, St. Charles Wealth Management, and you'll find them. Uh, I'm looking to get 50 of them out by the end of 2022. I do have more recorded, just uh, got to get them uploaded onto YouTube, which is becoming more of a process than uh, it has been before. Just running into some issues right now, but I should have it corrected very soon. Uh, and also feel free to check out my website, stcharleswealth.com. If you're looking for a financial advisor who uses the option product and is not afraid to do so, if it is appropriate for the client, of course. There you go. Check them out on the old Twitters at Mike Tussaw or stcharleswealth.com. All one word, also a good place to go. You know where to go to learn more about all these reports we have. They're running for you all the time. So even when you're not listening to a show like this, you could be out there crunching the numbers on fluid milk 
or oats or whatever else floats your boat out there, listeners. See me group.com slash twifo or slash twio. The places to go to begin your journey. If you want to upgrade to the premium version of the tools that we use here throughout the show, bantix.com, B A N T I X.com is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. And you also know where to go to learn more about all the madness unfolding in the world of small caps these days. FTSE, Russell, F-T-S-E, Russell.com is the place to go to learn more about all things rut, the skew, the vol, recon, what's going on with COVID, the impact of COVID on small caps, what's been happening with this correction and then the turnaround and why are small caps leading the dance, why are this volume of some of these products off the charts in terms of small caps and adjacent products, it's all there, FTSERussell.com. Give them a follow on the old Twitters while you're at it. At FTSE Russell is the place to go. All one word. We got to get on out of here, but don't worry, listeners. We're back at you tomorrow. Hot and heavy. Vol views, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. We got a lot of great vol to break down, some great guests to help us do that. And then, of course, back at you for all of you in the secret club, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, for some options oddities. How are all these crazy trades we're putting on? How are they working out? What new crazy trades did we spot this week? Well, you got to tune in to find out tomorrow. Secret Club fans, if you're not part of that Secret Club, theoptionsider.com slash Secret Club is the place to go to learn more. And again, we'll see you back here tomorrow for all those shows. And then back again next week for our full gamut of network programming all the way through to next Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. We'll see you then. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>